Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, as I was watching the uh, evening model runs come in last night, I was taking a look here at the winds about 10,000 feet above sea level and found some very fascinating features, including a deep upper level low that was spinning off the coast of the northwest. It's going to take several days for it to finally influence the northwest, where a large ridge is built in through here, keeping it very hot. Meanwhile, two separate shortwaves that were moving through the central part of the United States yesterday, giving us a very interesting precipitation pattern and both of them being pulled around a broader trough that's coming through the Great Lakes. These features will eventually merge giving us a deeper trough giving us unsettled weather for several days here in this section of the U.S. Meanwhile we did have the formation of tropical storm Isaias. I put down the pronunciation down there because it's a tricky one and there's an interesting interplay between that low in this high pressure cell to the north and where the eventual track will be. And we're also going to be talking very briefly at the beginning of this video about what's been going on down here in the tropics especially with our trade winds. So getting into this, that upper level low spinning off the northwest coast, very impressive to watch here. It's even ingesting a little bit of smoke on the back side of it. That's that hazy stuff that you see coming right in through this area. But it's going to take several days for this to get to uh, the, uh, the west coast. And as a result of that, some of the very high temperatures we saw yesterday, this is just a snapshot at yesterday's highs. In fact, I can isolate where we saw temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We're expecting to see high heat like this again today across the western part of the U.S. There is a bit of fire danger. This is just looking over the next 60 hours at the maximum uh, wind gusts that we're going to see. And notice that in parts of the Columbia Basin getting into central Oregon, we could be getting wind gusts in that area that do get over 30 to 40 miles an hour. The problem is, as those winds really blow, they're blowing extremely dry air. This is just a snapshot later on today of the relative humidity. And you can see that the, it's get, we get down to the single digits in relative humidity in the west. So with those stronger winds, we do have the risk of having fire activity. Now in the background, there's a map here showing you the uh, day one fire outlook. And you notice they've outlined an area that says ISO dry T. That stands for isolated dry uh, thunderstorms. These are thunderstorms that produce precipitation, but it evaporates before it hits the ground. You saw how dry things are. And as a result, we get quite a bit of lightning out of these particular storms that can start fires. And with the winds, we do have that region under a risk today of seeing seeing uh, the potential for fire. So it's the western United States that is dealing with the heat and there are many uh, regions out here or large regions that have excessive heat watches and warnings out and you're going to take a look at those temperatures in just a few moments. But in the midsection of the country it's heavy heavy rains moving through this area causing some flooding. And as we watch the radar animation that just gives us an idea of the kind of that double barreled low moving through the center part of the United States produce an interesting precipitation signature across parts of Nebraska where some of the storms on the back wave are moving from northwest to southeast, but you actually got some easterly flow on the uh, eastern side of Nebraska, so the storms move from multiple directions. Now the heavy rain moved through parts of Oklahoma, moved through parts of Kansas and Missouri in the overnight hours, and it's getting into Illinois this morning, but the question is what did we get on that really dry section of part of Iowa? Before I leave this animation though, do notice the scattered nature of the storms over parts of the southeast. That's really been the name of the game over the southeast over the last, well, several weeks. One thing I do want to point out to you, I thought this was fascinating this morning, right here, the outflow from some of the storms that move, move through Oklahoma produce what's called an undular bore. Can you see it there? It's those stripes that go racing through Oklahoma City. This is where we perturb the lower boundary layer when it stabilizes overnight and give you a, a gravity wave that rolls through there. And we can sometimes get a reflection off of that looking at radar. But let's come back to the last 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation. We can see the scattered nature of the storms over parts of the south and east. And we can see the heavier rainfall in Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, and that stuff's moving into Illinois early today. But what I want to do is I'd like to remove all precipitation from this map that's less than a half of an inch. And that's what you get here. We can really see then where the, the heaviest rainfall came in and where we needed it, which was right in this section of Iowa, only hit or missed storms through that area, really bringing in some heavy rain. So it was not as though it was completely corrective on the drought situation, which many of us were hoping that that particular feature would have given us more rainfall than it did. Next, let's talk about what's going on with Tropical Storm Isaias. You can see here that the National Hurricane Center is not projecting this to become stronger than a tropical storm. 
form as it traverses the greater Antilles because of the mountains, for example, over the island of Hispaniola. And the wind shear, remember that big high to the north of Isaias? The wind shear is going to be an impact on this as well. My concern is, should the system get close to the Carolina coast, the water temperatures there are warm. And if the wind shear values do back off a bit, we could see some quick and rapid intensification of this system as it moves closer. But there's been a pretty remarkable eastward trend in the path. And I think a lot of that has been due to the GFS guidance. You see, the GFS model has a very tight envelope here of, for, of its ensemble forecast tracks, keeping the system farther to the east, whereas the European has got a bigger spread and has a better chance of taking this over parts of Florida. At this point, we, we still have a lot of uncertainty. We won't get a good picture of this until it gets off of the island of Hispaniola and then over into the Bahamas to see if it does, in fact, move toward Florida or not. Again, my concern is if it gets near the Carolina coast, what might it possibly do? And that's because if you look at sea surface temperatures right now, and I zoom in here, we can see that those ocean temperatures right off the Carolina coast here are quite warm warm. So I'd be a bit concerned if we were able to get into that area, tap into that warm water and strengthen this system should wind shear calm down. By the way, the cool that you see here, this was from what was tropical depression, well, the tropical depression that became Hurricane Hannah extracting heat from the ocean. But backing this away, let's talk about the last feature I mentioned here at the beginning of the video. It's what's been going on in our La Nina region right in through here. We've seen quite a bit of cooler water emerge off of the west coast of Africa, excuse me, South America excuse me. And that could certainly change things up later on this year for what's going to be happening for the next planting season in South America. We'll talk about that very soon. But I want to point out to you that when you look at what's going on with those ocean temperatures in Nino region 3.4, which is inside this box I'm drawing here, we have started to see the uh, ocean temperatures drop off. And the trade winds strengthening the way they have have given us a positive southern oscillation index. So finally, the Central Pacific is giving us a, a La Nina-like flavor to the flow of the atmosphere. When we come back to the US though, uh, what I wanna show you here is the probability of getting at least an inch of rainfall over the next uh, seven days. And certainly coming out of Missouri this morning into Southern Illinois, chances of very heavy rainfall, and that moves east with time. We could be bringing in some much needed rainfall to parts of the mid-Atlantic getting down to the Carolinas as well. And we see that the European ensemble does bring this uh, system, Isaias, pretty close to Florida uh, too. Now, from here, what I'd like to show you is some model differences. But really quickly, the Storm Prediction Center over the next three days has isolated areas of marginal risk of severe weather. But at this point, no areas where we have you know, major concern of seeing widespread severe weather damage. But we can just take a look at these next three days here on these three maps. So let's get to these model differences. Here is the National Weather Service's outlook for the next week in terms of total accumulated precipitation. And we can see the influence of Isaias, and we can see the influence of the broader trough that's sitting through here and the weak boundary to its south. Now, what is interesting was the uh, earliest morning model runs from the European painted this picture for the next week. We see those same two features, Isaias here and the trough that's coming through the midsection of the country. But notice how wet the European model has this corridor right in through here. Now I'm gonna get my drawings off there and I'm gonna show you the difference between the European and now the GFS. European, GFS. Much different model solutions, European, GFS, if you're in parts of Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. And you can also see, as we get over toward the East Coast, the GFS operational run wants to keep ECS way off of the coast. Very important model differences here, especially if you're in the Carolinas. Why is this? What's going on here? Well, I want to take you up to the mid-levels of the atmosphere, and I want you to see some very subtle features. As I play the flow out from the GFS on the left and the European on the right, I stop this tomorrow morning and our differences begin to emerge right here. Now it looks subtle, but it's important. Do you see how much stronger this little jet streak is right through this part of Texas in the European? It is not there in the more open wave of the GFS. And why that's important is as we go through the day on Saturday right here, this is now getting into Saturday evening, uh, the differences really start to show up. The GFS has a wide open wave 
with Isaias coming right here off of the Bahamas and strengthening. The European is trying to close up this wave over Illinois, and it does not have a strong mid-level circulation from Isaias, and if it did, it's down here, still near the Bahamas and Florida, much slower progression of the system. But as we get out here to now Sunday morning, you can see the main wave cutting through Indiana, advecting to the north, pulling moisture with it in the European, and in the GFS, it's wide open, and it's gonna help kick Isaias out. This trough will push Isaias out over open ocean, whereas with the slower progressing uh, her, uh, tropical system here in the European, it comes underneath this wave and it vex more toward Florida. Well, that difference is showing up in a major way in the precipitation fields. Let me show you what I mean here. This is uh, starting off early this morning. So we can see the heavier rainfall that's moving out of parts of Missouri into Illinois in both models. They agree on that. As we then progress through the middle of the day and then this evening, yep, the rain does move in both models through parts of the Ohio River Valley. The European picking up on some heavier amounts uh, right in through here into parts of Indiana than the GFS does. But as we go on through the rest of the day on Friday, so this is Friday morning, afternoon, and evening. We can see general similarities in the placement of precipitation. See that? But we're about to see a pretty sizable difference in the overall flow. But they are similar in the placement of the rainfall. Notice the difference in the position of Isaias. Here it is in the GFS. There it is much slower and farther to the south in the European. As we move forward, remember the wave that comes out in the European? This is Saturday evening. It's right here. It's nowhere to be found really in the GFS model. And the GFS keeps it out of play, whereas the European through Sunday morning is now bringing heavy rainfall into this area. To be honest, I can make a case for why both models got this right at this point. It's going to be a challenging forecast that we're going to have to now cast our way through the weekend to see where this rain moves through. But it's going to be a bit maddening for folks in the eastern part of the Corn Belt, seeing one model produce quite a bit of rain and the other producing very little. As we work our way through the weekend into Monday morning, what's going to end up happening is there'll be higher pressure on the back side right in through here but there is an upper level low that's going to occupy this region for a while and it's going to keep the weather unsettled there as we progress through early next week you can just see generally a lot of precipitation scattered precipitation in this area monday through next thursday because of this upper level low that's sitting in place there i'd like to show you what i'm talking about by getting all the way out to day 10. we still see a deep trough in both models over alaska and the ridge that's to the west is in both models but they both come into better agreement about the placement and depth of this trough over the eastern part of the United States, which is why we now see a little bit better agreement in the week two precipitation forecasts. Still, the southwestern monsoon is getting shut down by this flow pattern, at least compared to normal, but we do have from the Canadian prairies, parts of the Canadian prairies, through the central United States and Midwest, wetter conditions showing up in both models. The GFS is drier along the south, and the Europeans trended that way a little bit, but I'm seeing some very inconsistent forecasts for parts of the Mid-Atlantic getting down into uh, the Carolinas right in through here. And that's going to be something we're going to have to watch in the model trends over the weekend to see how that plays out into next week. From there, let's talk temperatures. We'll give an international perspective and close things down here. Very hot day today across the whole of the West, from 115 in Phoenix to 119 in the deserts of, the, of California, 106 in parts of the Columbia Basin. That heat stays on west while cooler weather pulls in the middle part of the country, and we have the warmth that is running up the East Coast finally moving out. Ready? So this is Thursday. Getting into the day on Friday, you see a very similar setup here. Very hot west, cooler in the central United States, but finally starting to get some cooler weather in the northeast too. Saturday's temperatures, very similar story. Sunday is about the first chance we start to get back to what I would call normal for the northwest, but a lot of triple digits for the Central Valley of California. But take a look at those high temperatures on Sunday for the midsection of the country. That's a lot of mid to upper 70s with some low 80s on the southern side of this. That's what the influence is of that deeper trough. Cooler weather comes into the northwest Monday into Tuesday. But we see a lot of cooler weather hanging around the midsection of the country. And the models really don't want to get rid of it. In the 6 to 10 day time frame, they got a very consistent picture here of cooler than average conditions right in this section of the U.S. Something that a couple of weeks ago I didn't give uh, much credit to the models as to picking up on. So uh, that was certainly a major miss for me over the last few weeks. And right now, the models are tending to let that last all the way into the 11 to 15 day forecast. You can still see the slight cool bias in both models here while the west is forecast to warm back up under that ridge.
So we'll keep a close eye on that because the longer term models, this is the new release here from the CFS V2, says that week three, that's the 13th through the 19th, and week four, that's the 20th through the 26th, want to keep the cooler bias in the midsection of the country. I think the model is basing this off of persistence at this point. And the reason why I say that, keeping the heat west and east in the middle part of the country cool, is because I think we're going to get a bit more moderation in the forecast only because this is a section of the North Pacific Ocean, which I'm highlighting here, that going back to May has seen very little blocking. See, the values are near zero. So this tells me that, well, any cool shot or any warm shot that's come in over the last two months has just been that. It's been a shot at cooler weather, a shot at warmer weather through the midsection of the country. So while we may get the next uh, seven to 10 days being on the cooler side in the midsection of the country, will it really persist all the way through mid-month is still something we're going to have to watch carefully to try to understand. To finish up, I do want to talk about Europe. We can see here by looking at the next 10 days that much of, uh, of Europe is going to be seeing some drier conditions with the exception down there near the Alps. But from parts of France through Germany and then getting over into the the western parts of Ukraine, we do see drier conditions. We're wetter than average in parts of the Russian wheat belt getting more toward Kazakhstan. We'd have a cooler shot of air coming through over the weekend, but unlike, uh, excuse me, but just like the North Pacific, the North Atlantic has largely resisted blocking as well. Now to check in on how dry things are in parts of Europe, I just want you to pause the video and take a closer look at this map. It's showing you a soil moisture index anomaly. You can see in parts of France and Germany, some very dry conditions have emerged here, and there are pockets in Ukraine that have been dry as well. So this could be a critical thing to be looking at as we kind of project what the crops are going to look like coming out of Europe. But the last thing I'd like to point out to you today is over the next 10 days, we are still anticipating very heavy rainfall, much greater than normal that's moving over the major river systems that are draining here in the flooding district in this region of China. And uh, while the North China Plains getting some needed rain here, which is going to be a, a, a positive sign for crops there, the flooding that we've seen in parts of central China has been just truly amazing. Now, I do not know the condition of the Three Gorges Dam, and I know we're getting a lot of interesting reports about it, but I'll tell you this, when they open up those spillways to let that water out, it is truly impressive. We do need to watch carefully what is happening with this dam, given the additional precipitation, because um, should that dam fail, and that's just me saying should, we do know that there's about a half billion people that would be inundated by floodwaters, and that's substantial, uh, substantial number of folks to be worried about. It'll also certainly impact a lot of farm ground as well. So let's just watch it. Uh, keep an eye on the news as to what's going on here, but I showed you what the precipitation is doing. We're going to wrap it up right there. Have a great week. Check in tomorrow at my.nutrientactsolutions.com to see the latest long-range European uh, outlook in our regional forecast videos, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks.